This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked On Sports Minnesota, and it starts now. Back in the lab, Reggie and Luke back at it. Another episode of Superior Sports Talk presented by Locked On Sports Minnesota. Now, this is going to trigger a lot of Twins fans, but I'm going to the bullpen today. Don't say that. I'm going Don't to the bullpen that, today. We're Luke. bringing in no. yeah, our very no. own Sam Ekstrom from the Ron Johnson Show on the Locked On Minnesota Network. Sam, Reggie got us a three-run lead this week. Think you can come in and shut these guys down? Uh, I doubt it. I'm probably going to walk a guy. I'm probably going to give up a double <laughs> off the wall. Um, then my center fielder is going to going to overthrow the cutoff man and put a runner in scoring position. And then uh, a sack fly is going to bring in the go ahead run. So I, I'm feeling like I'm going to take a big, big L and disappoint Boy, thousands. Very detailed description there. Sounds very familiar, though. Hey, lots to catch yeah. up on today. Talking twins, blowing another late inning lead. Plus, which young talent for the Vikings is primed for a breakout season? Plus, later, I'm putting Sam on the hot seat with what does it mean. It's all coming up on Superior Sports Talk. So, let's talk about those twins, shall we? Back-to-back -back heartbreakers. If I was writing a movie, I could not come up with a better horror story for this Twins fans to watch. You head into the series, the lead shrunk down to one, eight of your next 11 with Cleveland, want to come out, make a good impression, got your studs on the mound, Joe Ryan, Sonny Gray, and not once, but twice, the Twins hold a huge late lead. Emilio Pagan serves up a two-run homer Tuesday. He's the one who gets the Twins into trouble again late last night with a three-run lead. Griffin Jack tries to come in and clean up the mess, but the Guardians for the second night in a row rally back from three runs down, beat the Twins at home. Twins now trail Cleveland in the division for the first time all season. Sam, I said to Reggie on yesterday's show, maybe Tuesday's loss was the best thing that could have happened to the Twins because now it's crystal clear twins have to go get pitching help before the deadline and then it happens again blown late lead copy paste you can't make this up here's a tweet from Aaron Gleeman last night the twins had a 97.9 win probability last night a 91 percent chance of winning Tuesday late in the game one game sure chalk it up to luck or something goofy happening but two nights in a row the writing's on the wall, man. It's in 4K, high resolution. Twins need relievers in the worst way. Yeah, um, and last night, you know, it's Pagan, who is initially kind of heroic. He comes into the eighth inning and strikes out the side, and then Rocco has a decision to make. And Rocco's under a lot of heat right now because mm -hmm. he's, he he pulls a lot of the wrong strings on this team, and I think we've, we've discussed that, and people get very frustrated with the way that he manages these games. And the bullpen's depleted. And Rocco has, you know, does he go to Duffy, who struggled? Does he go to Jax, who was used the day before? Does he stick with Pagan, who just struck out the side? And I think a lot of times you might say, well, I will stick with the hot hand, I guess. Well, Pagan's one inning turns into two, and the second inning goes terribly. And Pagan is the scapegoat. But just the bullpen in general was so depleted, and there are so few trustworthy arms in that group that, it's really pick your poison, except for Jahon Duran, who is the kind of the one stopper that you have. And even he hasn't been perfect. There, there is no one there that you're going to trust. I mean, Cotton had been pretty good, but he comes in last night and he really kind of started the carnage. I mean, the, the Indian or I'm sorry, the Guardians start coming back on on the front end of that bullpen and they just kept hitting and hitting and, and coming at him. And the Twins had done everything right in the start of that game. Uh, Sonny Gray gave him a strong start. The offense jumped out early. Your leader, Carlos Correa, hits two home runs, 5-1 lead. Um, you've got your the starters you want. You mentioned that. You set this rotation up so you've got Ryan and Gray. The offense is hitting. They're hitting early in games. They're getting timely hits late in games. What more can you ask uh, except for your bullpen to just close the game? Um, and I was a little bit perturbed that if Griffin Jacks was able to pitch, like, if he was available, because he did come on, he p finished the ninth inning, if he was available, why didn't he start the inning? That That's my second guess, because you probably should have gone with him to begin with instead of, you know, testing Pagan, who had no rest after Tuesday's game. So it's just, you know, and Rocco can't win in this situation because he has no arms in that bullpen, um, and it, it seems like they're going to 
have this issue now until the deadline when hopefully they can add some help. Um, but it's got to happen soon, Luke. You're absolutely right. Twins are doing all the right things except one. 15 runs the past two games, wasting a couple really good starts by pitchers. Hopefully not a matter of if, but when. If this is a season that you went into going to get Carlos Gray and said, hey, I think we're going to push some chips all in here. They have to go get some more help. That one hurt, man. It stings. And the only thing that could cheer me up, Sam, NBA Jam. NBA Jam is back thanks to Arcade 1UP, the leader in home retro arcade games. NBA Jam, Gold Golden T, Mortal Kombat, and more. Pre-order now from Arcade1Up.com. That's Arcade, the number one, up.com. Enter for a chance to win a game console for your man cave at Arcade1Up.com slash locked on. That's Arcade, the number one, up.com slash locked on. So, Sam, Terry Francona, manager of the Guardians, said last night that had Byron Buxton played in last night's game, Josh Taylor's double in the eighth probably doesn't happen as Buxton tracks that sucker down. Rest is history. The pitching takes all the heat, obviously. How much of Buxton missing some of these critical games and not being on the field during crucial moments starts to add up after a brutal loss like last night? Because Twins fans want to point the finger anywhere they can right now. They're frustrated that they've lost the last four or five. And when you're paying a guy 15 mil, and he's supposed to be the face of your franchise, he's going to take some heat when he only suits up as much as he has, and you see wins turn into losses like they did last night. Yeah, I've never seen a guy that correlates as much to wins and losses as Byron Buxton in the sport of baseball. Mm -hmm. Like in the sport of football, if quarterback's out, that's going to have a big impact. Basketball, there's only five guys on the floor. One guy means a lot. But in baseball, I've never seen a guy that can swing an outcome like Byron Buxton can. It's uncanny. And, it, and at this point, there's a pretty large sample size. When he's on the field, the Twins win. When he's not, they lose. And it is plays like that in a close game where you save either an out or even an extra base um, that can swing the outcome. Obviously, 90 feet of real estate means a lot late in the game when you're we're keeping runners at first or you know getting an extra out on the board. That's enormous. I thought, I think it's, it's not a guarantee to say that Buxton catches that ball. I mean, after all, he is kind of dealing with a bad knee. Maybe he's not quite at 100% and getting to those balls in the gap. Um, but you certainly missed him. And, and now the rumors are that he had the knee drained, which means that there, you know, there's, there's something more going on than just a little ache. And now I'm thinking injured list stint, 10 games out. You've got the Guardians for five more coming up next week. How's that going to go? I mean, if the Twins aren't careful here, Luke, They've got six more against the Guardians. If they lose four or five of those, we're talking a three to five game deficit when they just had a five game lead like a month ago. So this is going pear shaped really quickly. And I remember being on, on this show a month or two ago, Luke, we talked about kind of the twins coming back to the pack, the pitching evening out and regressing back to the mean. And that's happening. We knew that would happen. They weren't going to win every one run game for the whole year. That's happening. They're losing the one run games now. So now the Twins are facing real adversity. They're having to face their problems head on. Uh, what are they going to do? How are they going to handle it? This is a huge moment for this Twins front office that, that I think people are a little disenchanted with. I mean, they, they went and they got Correa, but what have they done about the pitching? That's always been the big question. And now they're, they're kind of having to face the music in that regard. Yeah, seems like forever ago, Twins were winning 11 of 12 on fire, 7-8 game lead in the Central. Twins still have plenty of time, though, to rebound six of the next nine against Cleveland on deck. Game three tonight in the backyard target field. Devin Smelcher on the mound this afternoon. Twins gasping for air at this point, watching their division lead just drown away. First pitch, 12-10 p.m. Central Standard Time. Rest assured, we'll be back here tomorrow to break it all down. Okay, so... The Minnesota Vikings kick off training camp in just over a month at the beautiful confines in Egan TCO facilities. PFF came out with an all 32 team ranking of each team's salary cap situation, not just for now, but the future as well. The Minnesota Vikings landed in the middle at 14, noting when Kwesi was brought in, many just assumed he'd blow the whole thing up and start from scratch. Instead, he gives Kirk a one year 35 mil extension and says, yeah. 
I got to have at least one season where I can see what he can do with Kevin O'Connell. One time. The article also notes the big decision he had to make with Daniil Hunter coming off back-to-back trips on the IR. He was due 18 mil. They get a new deal done. Essentially, he kicks the can down the road a bit. Same could be said about Adam Thielen, Harrison Smith. They signed new contract extensions. Sam, when you look ahead to next offseason, here's the big names set to hit free agency. Garrett Bradbury, Patrick Peterson, Irv Smith Jr. Next tier down, you've got Shandon Sullivan and Jesse Davis, both on one-year deals. But when you look at what Quasi has done with this cap as a whole and what next offseason's major questions will be, what's your overall assessment of not only winning in the now, but the plan two, three years down the road for Quasi and the Vikings? Because usually when you bring in a new regime, it's a given. They they get a window. They get you know three, four, five years to build their team and manage the roster their unique way. But Quasi seems to like what the old regime had built and enough to where it feels like rolling with the same core and nucleus, at least for this first season. Yeah, I felt like Quasi set up sort of a two-year window with this group. Because if you look at the Viking salary cap commitments, they've got over $200 million committed this year too. But next year as well, They've got $226 million committed. So the cap next year is still pretty full. I don't think they have a ton of flexibility going into next year. But then after that, there's a pretty big drop off where they can get out of some of those contracts. You look at look the way they created cap space this year. They reduced Kirk's number. They gave him that extra year. They reduced Thielen's number, gave him more down the road. They kicked the can on, you know, Daniil Hunter as well. So that they did sort of make some moves that kicked money into next year, and that's going to create, again, a little bit of a pickle for them um, bringing in new talent in 2023. But there's always creative ways to work around the cap. So I don't think that's the end of the world. Um, I think that by coming, they, they definitely stamped their identity of their intention. Uh, they created like this competitive team right away. That's probably mm-hmm. going to keep most of the guys around next year as well. So I don't think we're we're sitting on one year and done with this group. I think that they are committed to trying not only this year, but next year as well to win. Kirk obviously has the no trade clause, so it's fairly difficult to get out from under that contract. And if you're paying Kirk, you're probably going to try to create a good team around him. So it does feel like a bit of a two-year window. And within that two-year window, that is when you need to to groom some other talent. So if you're trying to groom a cornerback to replace Patrick Peterson, uh, you've got Andrew Booth Jr. You're trying to create a a safety to replace Harrison Smith maybe in a couple of years. You've got Lewis Seen. So I think they've done a nice job of setting up uh, a pipeline behind some of these higher priced veterans. Uh, You know, maybe Kendricks only has a couple of years left. You've got Brian Asamoah. So there are rookies that I think are strategically drafted who are not necessarily going to have a huge impact in year one, but will be able to replace some of those higher priced veterans down the road once those contracts are a little easier to get out from. I don't think that's next year. I think 2024 might be the first sign of some real turnover with this new regime. Always fun, worth noting, guys like the Daniil Hunters, Harrison Smiths, Thielens, Eric Kendricks, looking at their contract, looking ahead, they're going to have to back up the Brinks truck for Justin Jefferson here soon, but I think it all comes down to the quarterback for nearly every NFL team, and it's pretty black and white, right? Either you try your luck, draft a quarterback, get him on the rookie deal, pay him cheap for five years, and then have money to build around him. Seahawks showed us that blueprint. They struck gold with Russell Wilson. They built the Legion of Boom on defense, and they had a great run. Or you pay a premier top 10, top 12 quarterback, that big boy money, build the pieces around him through the draft. The key with that is, though, you're paying top dollar for a quarterback, then you better be getting top dollar play on the field that matches that contract. And I think that's what Vikings fans love to go back and forth about, whether it's Twitter, social media, you name it. When it comes to paying Kirk Cousins all that money, is he getting you your return on your investment? And I think when you look at some of these other quarterback deals around the league, paying Cousins 35 mil to get the kind of production he's had, it's not as bad of a deal as many people want to make it seem. Something that is as good as it seems, though, Sam. Blue Nile Jewelry. Make your moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com and Locked On Sports listeners get 50 bucks off purchases of $500 or more. Use code Locked On. That's code Locked On. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. So, the Vikings rank 14th in future cap. 
Green Bay Packers near the bottom of the list with a cap future mess at 28. It's no secret what they're doing, pushing the chips all in with this last little window. Aaron Rodgers paying him Jeff Bezos money over 50 mil a year. He's on back-to-back -back MVP seasons. Green Bay's won 13 or more games three years in a row, yet couldn't make the Super Bowl in any of those seasons. In fact, under Rodgers and all the accolades, only one Super Bowl to show for it. But yet, here we are, weak NFC North by many NFL experts, weak NFC conference in general. This is Super Bowl or bust territory for the Packers, is it not? I mean, the time is now or never. Yeah, that salary cap is, is super bloated, not only mm -hmm. this year, but next year and the year after that. If you compare the Vikings situation to the Packers situation, Packers situation is far, far worse. And it's no surprise that they couldn't keep Zadarius Smith. They couldn't keep Chin Sullivan. Um, they do bring back Jair Alexander. That's a big reacquisition. David Bakhtiari, is he going to be healthy this year? He's costing them a lot of money. Kenny Clark, Preston Smith still around. Devondre Campbell, that big new contract. Mm -hmm. Paying Aaron Jones, I shake my head. I I don't know I don't know why you you do that after you draft AJ Dillon, but hey, uh, you do you. Adrian Amos highly paid. Randall Cobb highly paid. Razul Douglas getting big money out of nowhere. Um, the Packers are squeezing that salary cap for everything it's worth, and they've still got Aaron Rodgers on their roster. So they are proof that when you can have a top paid quarterback and you can still find a way using those salary cap loopholes. To, to field a pretty competitive team. I, I do, you know, I, I worry about their depth, I guess. Are, are they going to have the kind of depth to withstand injuries? But when you have Rodgers, it's just, it's the panacea. It's the trump card. Like, you just have that guy that's going to will you to victory, do whatever it takes, and you don't need to have the depth. I mean, that covers up so many flaws on your roster um, that you you can let someone like Zadarius Smith walk, and you're probably going to be all right. So as as long as Rodgers is on that roster, Luke, I'm done underestimating this team. For two consecutive off seasons, I've sat I've sat here on probably on June 23rd, and I've said the Packers are going to regress. <laughs> and what have they done? They've they've won 13 games, a Baker's dozen, two years in a row, three years in a row in in total. So who am I to say that their depth is a problem? They've got Aaron Rodgers. They're going to be all right. And that's the absolute X factor, obviously. It's Aaron Rodgers, right? And and you're right. I mean, I think maybe some people worried about their depth a little bit. But when you look at their 11 starters, even on defense, it is a stacked Super Bowl caliber team. And that's why I think if you ask Packer fans, 13 wins every year. Yeah, that's great. Rodgers win an MVP. Sure, that's fun. But if they don't win a Super Bowl right now, I mean, look at the real threats standing in their way. I mean, Brady and the Bucks, sure. But outside of that, who is it? I mean, I got a thing for Super Bowl champs. They never repeat. It's just too hard with the target on your back all 17 games. So I think the Rams will digress a little bit this year. Then who? The Cowboys? The Eagles or the Cardinals? Maybe the Niners if, if Trey Lance can ball out? Going to be a lot of fun, though, to watch this 2022 season unfold. Of course, it all starts with training camp for the Vikings just over a month away at TCO facilities in Egan. Rest assured, you can find all your daily practice coverage right here on the Locked On Minnesota Network. All right, the time has come. My favorite segment's here. I'm putting Sam on the hot seat with what does it mean covering all the latest hot topics in Minnesota sports. First up, PFF's Mike Renner named the top 10 players to have a breakout campaign in 2022, and not one, but two Vikings made the list, cornerback Cam Dantzler and left guard Ezra Cleveland. What does it mean when which young Vikings will take the biggest leap from last year to now under a new coaching staff and another year under their belt? I mean, you can go the easy route. You can pick Dantzler or Cleveland. Nothing wrong there. Who else could maybe take a big leap this season if you were going to go outside the box a little bit? Who sticks out for you? Well, I fully agree with with Dantzler. I mean, first mm -hmm. of all, I think that Dantzler has probably been a little underrated because his end game meltdowns have been his calling card, but he actually has been a, a pretty good corner. Um, Cleveland as well, for sure. I think Kene Wangwu is probably a candidate that I look to. I mean, I, I saw during OTAs, they're using him very much in an interchangeable role with Alexander Madison. I don't think it's necessarily a an RB2, RB3. I think it's RB2, a and RB2B. And I think those two are going to be used based on the matchup, based on the situation. And I think they're going to get very similar reps. Alexander Madison's in the last year of his deal. That guy's probably not going to get re-signed. Um, so it's not as if you are, are building something with Madison. You're building something with Wong Wu. 
and you've got another two years after this one with him, and you want to integrate him into this offense with his explosions. So I think that he becomes a, a major like fantasy darling with the amount that he's going to catch the ball with his potential explosiveness. You're going to see big plays from him this year, I'm convinced of. So I think offensively, that's a gigantic breakout candidate. Defensively, uh, I'm having a little more difficulty because the, uh, the edge rushers are obvious. You know, it's Daniil and it's Sidarius. It's hard to say where the other pressure is going to come from on that defensive line. Um, is it going to come from, from Armin Watts on the interior? Is it going to come from like DJ Wanham? Is he going to find, find uh, kind of a resurgence? I don't know about that. Let's deep dive on that one because DJ Wanham was the guy I circled. And here's why. Because we know Zadarius and Hunter, they're not going to play all 17 games. I mean, I think most fans are hoping if we can get three quarters from each of them, I think you're happy with that. So there's got to be a third guy in the mix. Plus, you know, they're going to use a lot of different looks. They're going to use a lot of different sub packages. If it's Daniil Hunter moving around, all right, he's over the A-gap. He's over the center and guard. Well, who else is on the edge? Maybe it's Sidarius, in fact, who's moving around more like a chess piece than Daniil Hunter when it's all said and done. But DJ Wanham quietly had eight sacks last season. And I think when you think about the time that's most likely going to be missed by Hunter and Zadarius for at least a handful of games here or there. Zadarius 31 getting long in the two, coming off a major back surgery as well. Hunter landed on the IR the last two seasons. Wanham could be not only a third rotational piece that's used a lot on pass rushing downs, but he may end up being the starter, just the second guy. More games than not by the time this 2022 season's all said and done. Quietly had eight sacks. I think that's the guy that I'm thinking about gotten better every season and now you're hitting what his third fourth season I think he's starting to hit that peak of really how good he could be so that's one I love that you brought up Kenny Nwangu I love to get those insider scoops that it's actually been him working with that second team just as much as Alexander Madison if the writing wasn't on the wall Madison was likely not going to be re-signed when they drafted Nwangu it for sure was on the wall when they drafted Ty Chandler you're just not going to keep all these guys so Madison likely gone I think they think they found a serious diamond in the rough, a gem with Kene Nuwangu. We saw the speed last year, not one but two return touchdowns on special teams. Now we're going to see him start to actually get implemented inside the offense a little bit more. That should be a lot of fun too. So I like those two names that you mentioned, Wanam, Kene Nuwangu. Thielen, you know, he's been known to miss a handful of games. What if KJ Osborne ends up stepping into that wide receiver two role? Justin Jefferson's double, triple coverage. What if KJ Osborne takes his game to another level. I think everybody's expecting big things, but if he were to actually get wide receiver two type of targets, that could be another one that inside this offense could end up doing some big things. I'm just going to throw one more random name out here. What's going on with Chaz Surratt? It's a third round pick, and I know he's a converted quarterback to linebacker is going to take him a little bit. I know this linebacker situation is absolutely muddled once you get past the starters, but I have a hard time just writing off a third-round pick after just one season. I'm not saying he's going to be a breakout by any means, but I'm just keeping tabs, a close watch. I'm going to be checking in with you when you're out at TCO during training camp, seeing what a guy like Chad Surratt is going to be doing. Any other last name you want to fling out? Possible breakout candidate for next year. Yeah, I think Bynum. I think Cam yeah. Bynum yeah. being in that starter's role. Mm -hmm. I don't think Lewis Seen is guaranteed to start. I think nope. Lewis Seen could start out as, out as a sub package guy. And I've I've always viewed Lewis Seen as, you know, sort of a a groomed safety in the future for Harrison Smith, but not necessarily a starter in week one. Um, if Cam Bynum plays the way he did in those two starts last year. Um, I love his chances to be a breakout star, and he could be the next great safety to play next to Harrison Smith. You know, Sandejo had some great years. Anthony Harris had some elite years. Mm. Xavier Woods had a nice little run last year. Um, so I, I'm really bullish on Cam Bynum. Everybody's just assuming Lewis Seen's just going to come in and take that job. Maybe it's three safety sub-package looks. You bring in all three safeties at the same time. Maybe... They got a long-term plan with Harrison Smith just to save his legs a little bit and get as much as they can, you know, last two, three years of his career. And maybe they get Lewisine and Cam Bynum on the field at the same time and give Harry a breather, given that certain down and distance and situation in the ballgame. All right, next one up. 
Justin Jefferson is currently the second favorite to win the receiving title behind only Cooper Cup at 8.5-1, to one, while Dalvin Cook tied for fourth to win the rushing title with Nick Chubb at 11-1 behind only Jonathan Taylor and Derrick Henry. What does it mean when it comes to the best value bet for the NFL futures category you've seen this offseason? If I were to give you 20 bucks, what's the juiciest return that mm. catches your eye? Could be anything. J.J., Cook, Rookie of the Year, MVP. I'm giving you the entire board here, tossing you a soft. Who do you like? Um, can I pick a team or do I have to pick yeah, a team? Yeah, absolutely. Player? Whole board's okay. open. So I took a look at the AFC West division title odds. Mm-hmm. Chiefs are minus 160, obviously the favorites. I'm not sure that they should be because I look at that division. The Chargers are charging. Justin Herbert is a star. They're plus 300. The Broncos Oof. were a pretty good team last year without a quarterback. Now they have a quarterback, Russell Wilson. Um, and I know I just disrespected Teddy there. Don't get mad at me, people. Um, but <laughs> the Broncos are plus 500. Plus 500 with That's Russ. That's insane value with Russell Wilson. Are you kidding me? And speaking of value, we're sleeping on the Raiders here. Mm-hmm. They were a playoff team. They got Devontae Adams, and they're plus 1,200. Jeez. Plus twelve hundred. So wow. I mean, so if you if you lay out fifty dollars on each of those underdogs, you're gonna either get your money back on you know the Chargers, or you're gonna make money on the Broncos or the Raiders if you just ch- bet against the Chiefs, um, because the Chiefs are gonna have to play six division games against all of those pretty good teams. They lost Tyreek Hill. It's been a four year run for them in the AFC Championship game, unprecedented. But at some point, that is going to you know, come to roost, and they're not going to be a division winner. Probably a wildcard team, but someone is going to beat them out. And there's three teams, and I think any of them can do it. So I would bet against the Chiefs and bet on, you know, spread your money around if you want in that AFC West division. Yeah, I really like that. It's absolutely the best division in football. They're going to beat each other up. I'm taking a shot, throwing a dart up on the board with one of those value plays for sure. Chargers 3-1, to one, uh, Broncos 5-1 to one with Russell Wilson, 12-1, to one, you're right, with Derek Carr and Devontae Adams. I'm going defensive rookie of the year, 11-1 to one odds. They're practically giving away this money here, Sam. Ravens safety Kyle Hamilton. Are you kidding me? My number one player on the draft board. First thing with rookie of the year, you got to look about their path to starting. They're already starting Kyle Hamilton right out the gate next to Marcus Williams at Ravens OTA. You know, the guys who usually win defensive rookie of the year, they have a lot of sacks, right? They impress you, hence why Aiden Hutchinson, Trevon Walker, Tibbs for the Giants, they're the three favorites. But think about it. Hamilton's going to get sacks. He's going to get interceptions. He's going to get forced fumbles. And he's going to tally a boatload of tackles. He's the total pack. At 11-1, to 1. Sam, what's for lunch, man? I'm buying. Anything you want. You call it out, man. Hey, I'll give you one more, too, I really like. Najee Harris at 15-1 to 1 to win the rushing title. Mm. I really like that one. Rookie quarterback brought in. Yep. They're going to give Najee 400-plus touches this year. He's one of the rare young guys on the list that's young, fresh, doesn't have a lot of wear and tear on the tires. He's going to be able to carry that load. Henry often gets dinged up. Cook often gets dinged up. Jonathan Taylor, the favorite. Yeah, sure, not a bad bet there. But if you want value, Najee Harris at 15-1. to 1. I think is just great value if you're looking for one of those value plays. What do you think about those two? 400 touches for Harris. That's that's bold. That's, hey, the Steelers that's love to run the ball, man. Steelers yeah. love the run. I mean, let's check it. Last year, probably at close to 350. So and the point is, the Steelers will run the ball, and they'll run the ball a lot. And he's the clear-cut number one guy, and he's young. He's hungry. No tread on the tires. He's ready to roll. He's ready to carry that low. 15 to 1 It's just very enticing. So, you know, and this new Vikings offense, too, by the way, how could you not love JJ at 8.5 to 1, knowing that he's going to be in that Cooper Cup role, the only guy ahead of him on the list at 8 to 1? Going to be a lot of fun to follow along. And see how he gets used under Kevin O'Connell, much like Cooper Cup was in L.A. Vikings, by the way, open up at one and a half point dogs. Week one at home at the bank versus Green Bay. We'll be watching that one to see how that moves as we get closer to kick off the 2022 season. Hey, we're talking about props. We got the NBA yep. draft tonight. Are you are you throwing the mortgage on Chet Holmgren to go number one tonight? Plus 500. Would- 
I, I probably wouldn't throw the mortgage on him. He would be the number one pick if I was picking for the Magic. It sounds like they may go. It, it's kind of a two-man well, it's race. The, it's the Thunder. Thunder are number one, aren't they? Uh, Orlando number one. It seems like a two-man race, Sam. I mean, Chet Holmgren, I think he slides to number two to Oklahoma City. I think the Magic look elsewhere for their big man, Jabari Smith. But it's anybody's guess, Sam. It's going to be a lot of fun, though. NBA draft. Uh, quick reminder, too, as we wrap up before we go. The first picks of the Ultimate NBA Mock Draft have been made. Search now for Ultimate NBA Mock Draft and get over 50 insiders. The Odyssey Sports experts, the draft experts of Locked On NBA Big Board, the five-episode Ultimate NBA Mock Draft is underway. Make Ultimate NBA Mock Draft your second listen today after this one. It's not too late. Give it a listen. Get primed up, ready to roll for the NBA Draft tonight at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Rest assured, we'll be back tomorrow to break all that action down. Any final takeaways or thoughts about the draft tonight? Yeah, so Timberwolves at 19. Yep. Um, I'm, Trade I'm not for a lie. veteran, maybe? Or what do you do yeah. with that? What are you thinking? So I'm not going to lie to you, Luke. I, I look at all the names and... The only name that stands out to me is Nikola Jovic mm -hmm. from Serbia. And you know why? Because I just watched Hustle, and I want to have the big, lanky European guy He's a movie trained star. by Adam Sandler on the Timberwolves. No, but but here here's the way. And that he's already the got Wolves... the chemistry with Anthony Edwards, who is also in the movie, too. Exactly. Yeah, automatic. It's perfect. Um, no, the... Uh, the Timberwolves could make a splash tonight if they make a big trade. If they mm -hmm. draft someone at 19, that's fine. I'm not convinced that that's going to change their fortunes for the 2022-23 season. Now, if they pull a, a, a Tibbs and they make a big draft night trade, like when he brought in Butler in exchange for Levine, if they make a deal that's going to bring in some fresh blood that can help them right now, that'll get me excited. Um, if they trade Russell and get rid of that salary and open money up for free agency, that'll get me excited. Um, they've got a new president of basketball operations in, in Tim Connolly, who is going to have to make some bold franchise altering decisions. And he's been here for like two weeks. Like he's just learning his way, like to get downtown. He's learning the exits to take. He's trying to find his way to the office and he's got to decide on the fate of this franchise tonight. I don't envy his position, um, but I think the Wolves, uh, my prediction is that they just stand pat and pick with nine, 19. They don't rock the boat. Um, but if they want to get a, get weird, get exciting, I, I, I think they might deal D'Lo. Let's get weird, man. New regime. You're right. A lot of pressure on Tim Connolly coming in, starting to finally find his footing here in Minnesota, and boom, all of a sudden, his first NBA draft up tonight, 7 p.m. Again, rest assured, we'll be back here tomorrow to break all that action down. Back here tomorrow, breaking down more Twins, Vikings, plenty more. Remember to like, rate, review, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Join us every day for another episode covering all the biggest topics in Minnesota sports. He's Sam Ekstrom. Follow him on Twitter, at Sam Ekstrom. I'm Luke Inman on Twitter, at Luke underscore Spinman. Tune in tomorrow to Superior Sports Talk, part of Locked on Sports Minnesota. For Sam, I'm Luke. Until tomorrow, signing out. This is Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Inman, part of Locked on Sports Minnesota.